Hello and welcome. I am Bob Lee, the Executive Director of the Institute for Applied Management and Law. Thank you for joining us for the IAML alert on the impact of the recent NLRB decision in Browning Ferris Industries. You may wish to follow along on the accompanying online PowerPoint. We are pleased to introduce John Weimer as our esteemed presenter for this election. John will provide a background, history, overview, and his take, most importantly, his take on this decision. There is none better, Mr. John Weimer. John, take it away. Thank you, Bob, for those, those kind words. Brownie Ferris Industries case was recently decided by the Labor Board and is, in my view, as important in an NLRB case that has been decided perhaps since the history of the National Labor Relations Act. From your standpoint, I guess the question is, why should I be interested in this? Or better stated, who should be interested in Brownie Ferris? First of all, whether you're unionized or non-union makes no difference. Brownie Ferris applies to you. Second. If you are an employer who has employees on your property who work for someone else, then Browning of Ferris applies to you and you should pay particular interest. Almost every employer in America, in addition to having its own workforce, contracts with other companies to, to provide certain services, whether it's having security on premises, IT services, maintenance, custodial services, temporary employees, or just companies with whom they contract to provide some service on the premises. This case is critical on a going forward basis to how you do business. The facts of Browning Ferris are fairly straightforward. And, and the relationship between Browning Ferris, which NLRB refers to as the user company, and a company called Leadpoint, which the NLRB refers to as a supplier company, was a classic example of what I just described. Browning Ferris is a recycler. And one of the functions in a recycling plant is to sort the incoming materials into various categories before they can then go through the recycling process. Browning Ferris subcontracted out that sorting function to Leadpoint. Leadpoint selected its own workforce disciplined its own workforce, evaluated its own workforce, and terminated its employees without any involvement of Browning Ferris. Lead point even went so far as to have its own human resources manager on Browning Ferris's property. Conversely, Browning Ferris selected its employees, supervised them, evaluated them, disciplined, and discharged them as well. In short, they were two entirely separate and distinct workforces with two entirely separate and distinct sets of supervisors including an on-site supervisor that represented lead point on the, on the property. Lead point decided how much it paid its employees, decided what shifts they were going to work on, and controlled entirely the terms and conditions of its own employees. The Teamsters Union, however, filed a petition for an election. And it named not just, and they wanted to, to organize the lead point employees, but also named Browning Ferris as a co or joint employer. And in this case, the National Labor Relations Board, uh, deciding to not follow 30 or 40 years of precedent, said that in this case, despite the divisions that I just described between the two workforces, that Browning Ferris is, in fact, a joint employer or co employer with lead point. The board based this decision on the fact that even though Browning Ferris had no direct control or involvement in anything that Lead Point did or its employees did, that there was in place a labor services agreement pursuant to which Browning Ferris had the right to require Lead Point to meet or exceed Browning Ferris's own standard selection procedures and tests when it hired employees. Browning Ferris had the right to require that lead point hires first pass a five panel drug screen. And the contract also prohibited lead point from hiring anyone ineligible for rehire at Browning Ferris. Browning Ferris was evidently concerned that if it fired someone and who was then not, not eligible for rehire, it's, they certainly didn't want that person to come back to the premises through the back door of lead point. And the agreement gave Browning Ferris the right to reject any lead point worker for, quote, 
any or no reason, end quote. Even though Browning Ferris had no direct role in how much Lead Point paid its employees, it did have a provision that said Lead Point would not pay anyone who was performing work comparable to a Browning Ferris employee, would not pay anyone more than Browning Ferris paid. Again, Browning Ferris was understandably concerned that it didn't want its employees to go over to Lead Point where they could make more money. Even though Browning Ferris never exercised any of those rights, uh, the board said that Browning Ferris, pursuant to that labor services agreement, indirectly controlled the Lead Point employees. That by having these, these requirements as to who Lead Point could hire and what the standards would be, and, and that there would be a cap on how much lead point could pay its employees, that that gave Brownie Ferris, the user, indirect control over lead point's employees to the extent that Brownie Ferris and lead point were deemed to be joint employers. And even though Brownie Ferris had, had no involvement in firing or disciplining any lead point employee, there were two situations cited that where Browning Ferris probably went too far. On one occasion, a Browning Ferris manager saw two lead point employees panty, uh, handing a, a pint of whiskey back and forth to one another. The Browning Ferris manager contacted lead point, described what he had seen, and recommended that those two employees be dismissed immediately. There was another occasion where the uh, Browning Ferris uh, surveillance tape captured a lead point employee causing damage to uh, Brownie Ferris property. Brownie Ferris notified lead point and again recommended that the employee be quote unquote immediately dismissed. So the ramifications are enormous. The most important thing I think to think about at this juncture though is what could you do preventively to avoid this problem or at least to reduce the risk. And there are three things that I encourage you to think about. Number one, in establishing a relationship with a supplier, if you're the user, uh, or with a user, if you're the supplier, would it not make more sense that rather than having the user require the supplier to meet certain standards, for the supplier simply to promise affirmatively and voluntarily that it will meet certain standards. So rather than having being required by the user, the supplier simply says, these are the things that we intend to do. Second, there are certain rights that Brown and Ferris had that, frankly, I don't think they would ever have exercised and had no need to. For example, the right to reject the suppliers and uh, workers for any or no reason. The reason you select a supplier is because the supplier hires the right people and promises affirmatively to hire people who are qualified. There's no reason for Brown and Ferris to get involved in, quote, unquote, rejecting an, a, anyone who uh, the supplier, in this case, lead point provides. And the third thing to think about is better training for user managers. Browning Ferris would have been better off if the manager who observed the two lead point employees handing a pint of whiskey back and forth between themselves and the uh, Browning Ferris manager who observed an employee uh, on surveillance tape, a lead point employee causing damage to Browning Ferris property, to simply report that without any admonition, suggestion, uh, or hint that those employees should be immediately dismissed. If you do those three things, I think you significantly reduce the likelihood that you'd be found to be a joint employer. Two more things to think about. Number one, what if Browning, Ferris, and Lead Point follow my advice and restructure their relationship so that it is more Lead Point affirmatively promising to do certain things as opposed to Browning, Ferris requiring Lead Point to do certain things? and eliminating some unnecessary rights. Could Browning Ferris then file what's called a unit clarification petition with the Labor Board and say we're no longer a joint employer? I think the answer to that is, quest, uh, is yes. The second question is the flip side of that question, though. What if you have some, uh, a company on your premises, a security provider, maintenance company, company that sorts the materials as they come in that you pay, and that is already represented by a union. Could the union under Browning Ferris then file what's called a unit clarification petition and say, you know, the user employer has sufficient control over what my employer, the supplier, does that, that they should be identified as a co-employer and they should have to sit down and bargain with us 
so that we have both the user and the supplier employer present in the room? I think the answer to that question is probably yes as well. Even though the Browning-Ferris case arose in the context of a representation election, it could be used in a number of contexts outside a union representation election in order to corral a user employer into being a co-employer. Well, thank you, John. Thank you very much for the clarification, the insights, and your recommendations on this important decision. Uh, this is but this example in, of an IML alert is but one example of what John shares in IML's advanced update in employment law conferences. There'll be two conferences offering this year in Las Vegas in October and in Orlando in November. Please take advantage of uh, what John can offer further with a number of other uh, uh, topics during these important conferences. With that, I want to thank you very much for joining us. John, thank you very much again. You're very welcome. Thank you, Bob.